Dennis County. So I came from New York, uh, 95. So I've been doing something good to be still doing well. Um, I don't get paid for this talk. So <laughs> you know, whatever we're talking is good for you. I don't get paid by drug companies or food companies or Jenny or anyone. I just do it for community. Um, so I go to two hospitals, um, model plant in downtown Clearwater and uh, Largo Med. So a lot of doctors start going to the hospitals. Um, any of your doctors go to the hospitals? Raise your hands. So we got one, two hands. Yeah, so the, the new trend is hospitalists see you in the hospitals and which is, you know, has its own good and bad, but you know, a lot of my patients love to see a familiar face when they're sick. So, and I enjoy the collegiality with other specialists. It helps me grow as well. So it's a win-win for patients and me, but it's getting difficult uh, for the physicians to, you know, go to the hospitals. So today's topic is what you guys are doing right now is putting food in your mouth. So let's see what you got on your plates and see. Oh no, don't play me. I'm the one that popped. But there's healthy choices. Yeah, there are some healthy choices. So, you know, we see some. Oh, we see some bananas and, and veggies. So, yeah, yeah. You did a good job, Jenny. We'll talk about what's not good for you. <laughs> so, you know, the body, my professor of nutrition used to say the temple. So you give good offerings, good shit happens. So let me repeat myself. You give good offerings to the temple, good shit happens. And that's what this talk is about. How to get your gut healthy. And you know, a lot of new data is coming out that if your gut is happy, the body is happy. Which makes total sense. Because nutrition hydration goes through the gut and if we do well there there is less inflammation throughout the body there's less colon cancer so uh, let me share a story which will bring up i know you guys are eating so it's not a great story but i'll share it anyway it will give you context to this talk so there's a researcher in uh, university of uh, california and in Francisco, 15, 20 years ago, he has Crohn's disease. Anyone knows Crohn's disease? Okay. It's a very bad disease of the gut. So he was seeing interesting pattern that in countries, Asian countries, African countries, where there is less processed food, more people, you know, eat fiber and fruits and vegetables and grains, and a lot of fish, those countries have less Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. That's another inflammatory bowel disease. And he had Crohn's disease himself and debilitating. He was about to go for surgery. So one of his colleagues in Asia said, hey, you know, maybe it's something uh, in the water, in the food. So he went over to, uh, I think, India or Vietnam to see, uh, look at the data, what people eat and why they have less uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So what he found is very interesting. He found A, uh, what we're going to talk about in this segment is the pre and the prebiotics, which will explain what prebiotics are, and the probiotics. So they're two different things, pre and pro. Much more readily used in the Eastern Asian diet and African diet than Western diet. Second thing he found is uh, that there are parasites, you know, because of the hygiene and this, this, the, the sewage and all that is more prevalent there in the gut. And you would think it's a bad thing. But interestingly, it's not that bad. It, it gives you a dose of inflammation and infection low grade to your gut all the time that it, it's like, you know, having a flu shot every year. You know, you get a flu shot every year, your chance of getting flu get less. Even when you get flu, you know, it won't be as bad that you end up dying. And by the way, flu has come to Florida. So if anyone didn't have a flu shot, it's a good time to do it, irrespective of my topic today. 
So, so you know, he learned all that and came back to his lab and changed his diet, became vegetarian, you know, started having uh, all those foods which he learned, uh, you know, which we'll talk about, pre and probiotics. And he started taking a little bit of the parasitic poa in his food. Crazy idea. But long and behold, in a year, his colitis went away. So that's how powerful it is to what we put in our mouth. So, so the topic today, as it says, is good food for your guts. So, you guys went through the list, the good foods. All right, so we'll start with saying, <coughs> what are the different parts of the gut? Most of you know the mouth, the esophagus, then it goes to small intestine, the large intestine, and then it comes out to your rectum. Simple. And a lot of people have a misconception, you know, when they think that we are omnivores. No, we're not. If you think about omnivore, that means you are, our gut is set up for both plant-based diet and animal-based meat. It, it was, if you look at the evolutionary path in the past, you know, they, they market paleo diet, the caveman diet. But if you think about it, it doesn't make any sense for cavemen to have no guns, no tools, to get a big animal who has better senses than they had at the time, to catch them every day. You know, what they're going to catch every day is roots, fruits, anything which is readily available, weeds or something, in grass, anything of those kind. And if they get lucky, they will have some meat here and there. And that's how our gut is set up. And the meat was not that predominant at that time because they didn't have fire in the, you know, we're talking way back. Till we got fire, we started able to make the meat more chewable, more, you know, tastier. And if you think about it, if you look at a gut of a carnivore, a true carnivore, let's say a lion or a tiger, their gut is about one-tenth our size. One-tenth. Because they got sharp teeth, they got a different metab to digest that meat. Our gut is 10 times longer than the lion. And why is that? Because if you eat something which is plant-based, let's say you consume, I saw lettuce on your you know, buns. Let's take the example of lettuce. As it goes through your mouth, it goes through your esophagus, it goes through your stomach. That's the first place it gets digested and assimilated. Of course, the mouth also does some by chewing, by saliva. But then the stomach is your biggie. You know, it put the acids up there to break it down. But it's still not enough. So then it has to go to small bowel, which is a misnomer, which is bigger than the large bowel. But, you know, it's a smaller in caliber, so that's why it's called small bowel. And then all the juices from the pancreas and your gallbladder comes there, plus the bacteria there. And mark that word, bacteria. Very important word. The good bacteria there, they help to digest too. And then it goes to colon, and the fluid gets digested, absorbed, and then it goes as a waste. But it's huge. The small bowel and the large bowel is huge for that reason, to break down the plant products. And as we move, became more affluent in the last hundred years, and uh, in the Western diet, the meat became a predominant food. And if you look at uh, any economy which goes through a cycle of you know, developing country to developed country, the meat consumption goes up. You look at China, the big consumption is out of fruit. They think that's you know, a better way or affluent way to eat. But interestingly, if you look through all this, and this I didn't produce, this came from you know, all the, uh, the research that Shimana put together, and I'm just talking about the bullet, key bullet point to explain. So, the, if you look at this list, it does not say meat in big letters. But if you look at what you consume every day, that's the one of the biggest. Uh, and, and you know, nothing wrong in thinking because that's how we grew up. You know, since birth, mom said, "Hey, you know, have your meat to 
can be have protein and you could be more athletic and all the marketing behind that, you know, all the burgers pushed by the athletes. I was reading a study and they found that the meat industry right now is using the same marketing company which the tobacco industry used 20, 30 years ago. It's called a company called Evolutions. They're using the same strategy. They're using superstar athletes to push meat. Is it good? I didn't put this together. <laughs> you know, once a week, sure. But the right kind of meat, and we'll come to that. But most of the list, if you see up here, is plant-based. And coming back to my original uh, theory about, not theory, but you know how we set up with our small ball and large ball being so large, we got to use it. You know, otherwise you get more indigestion. If you, uh, and then more inflammation, more colitis. And that's the other piece I just alluded to the story I told you about the, the researcher in San Francisco. So let's go through the different categories here and give you some tips of implementing that every day. Let's start with breakfast. How many in this room have cereal for breakfast? All right? So most of us do cereal because it's convenient. I have breakfast. Oh, that's cereal on the box? Or any kind of cereal. Yeah. So most of us, yeah, most of us have cereal. It's very convenient. Take a box, put some milk. You know, it says nice things up there, the whole grain. But if you dissect it down, there is no fiber in that, that meal. So you miss one meal without fiber right away. You know, you got some sugar, mostly processed sugar. And you got some dairy, which is decent. You know, you got some protein through that. But you got no fiber. So if you have to change one thing after the start, have yogurt, you know, two, three times a week. I know it's hard to change every day, but change one day a week. Have yogurt. And believe it or not, whole fat yogurt is better, you know, for you. You know, the low fat body does need fat. Fat is very malign. We'll come back to the question. Let me just uh, go through it, you know, and then we'll have time for question and answer. So whole fat yogurt, but don't put, get the flavored yogurt, which is uh, the fruit at the bottom. Bad choice. The bad choice. Because there is so much sugar in that that you're wasting, you know, the whole, uh, the concept of having a good starting point of your day. So plain yogurt, whole fat yogurt, and make sure, you know, if you read the box, it should say live cultures. Some don't, so make sure it, is, it does say live cultures. And then you add some fruit to it, any fruit, I don't care. Whatever is in season, whatever is cheap in the local farmer's market or grocery store. Banana is great. It's easily available. Cheap. You know, uh, you don't need to go fancy. If you, if strawberries are in season, we live in Florida, you know, fantastic. Whatever fruit you can find cheap. And then add some cereal if you want to, granola if you want to, you know, to get some grains. Add some nuts if you want to. Walnuts, Pecans, almonds, great nuts. Peanuts less, cashews less, but all of the nuts, put that on top of that yogurt. Now you have, if you look through this list, most of the items tick mark. You got your probiotics, which I'll explain to you in a minute. You got your prebiotics from the fiber you're going to get from the fruit and the nuts. And you got, you know, some protein, the, the, the dairy-based protein, which is digested protein. That means not, as we go older, the, the milk digesting capacity, the, the lactose breakdown capacity of the guts, it becomes sluggish. So you've probably seen that if you have a big glass of milk, you feel more bloated, more gassy, your girlfriends run away, your boyfriends run away. But that's normal for the gut to start having difficulty with digesting milk. But yogurt, it's already fermented. And we'll talk about fermented foods here. 
and that become easy to digest. So now, from that milk and the cereal thing, you shift it a little bit. Not a whole lot, still very tasty, still very flavorful, you know, it's not, you know, that you have to cook for 20 minutes like your oatmeal, which you can, sure, do go for it. But it's all pouring things, it's not that taxing. I know some people, you know, want quick and easy, and that's quick and easy. So that's one breakfast idea if you can implement from my talk, it will make a big difference in your nutrition moving forward. While we're in the topic, let's talk about the prebiotics and probiotics and get that out of the way. How many in this room take probiotics pills? All right, we got one lady here. Throw it out of the window, save money. The, the problem with the pills, uh, I'll catch your name. Carmen. Carmen. So we got Carmen and she takes probiotics pills and you know they love um, you know people take it and I tell them save money the reason why you know it's not a great idea a we don't know what how much is active in those pills the bacteria <coughs> they may say two million have you checked and grew in the petri dish and counted two million and then the other thing is that what kind of bacteria at least with the live cultures and the fermented foods, you know, the bacteria have choice to grow. Here, you know, the human uh, industrial complex is making the bacteria grow. There, at least the bacteria are growing on their own free will. Anything which grows on their free will is happy. Anything which human pushes to grow is not a happy thing. So, Get the probiotics from the fermented foods. Yogurt is one. Sourdough bread is another one. Not difficult. Kimchi. I don't know how many knows mm -hmm. kimchi. Yes, there's kimchi rice. There's kimchi. You know, in Korea, like in uh, you know Western countries, we say cheese for smile for pictures. They say kimchi. That's how pervasive it is in Korea. Any fermented food like kimchi, sourdough bread, yogurt, uh, and then sauerkraut, you know, uh, kefir. Kefir, how many in this room know about kefir? Oh boy, she should give the talk and she should. <laughs> kefir is... So kefir is a interesting beverage. It came from um, Europe, and Central Asia, somewhere around there. And it is a fermented milk. Ready for the going to Hawaii? The captain is ready. Yeah. All right, so the fermented milk kefir is a fantastic base for smoothies or just drinking. Again, for breakfast, you want to have a banana and a cup of kefir. Beautiful. One of the most probiotics from a drink you can get is from kefir. You know, and this is freely available in public or any grocery store where the Greek yogurt is. K-E-F-I-R, it's on here. So, so what else is fermented which is good? Kombucha, anyone knows about kombucha? Yes. Yes, so the kombucha came from Manchuria. Interesting place. Now it's fashionable, you know, you can get kombucha at Starbucks, you can get kombucha at Publix. It's a fermented drink. And again, the fermentation does the trick. It attracts the friendly bacteria, it attracts the yeast. It is what gives the probiotics, which is lye. The word is lye, not capsules, but lye. So anything fermented, not in vinegar. Vinegar is not as a good fermentation method. But, you know, uh, what I alluded to sourdough, kombucha, kimchi, kefir, sauerkraut. Sauerkraut came from Germany. You know, there's different from cabbages you can get from Publix. Pick it up, put it with your meals, you know, instead of salad. Good flavors. Nothing expensive, affordable. <coughs> Um, 
right, so we talked about fermented foods. Buttermilk is another one I miss. I know not many people are a fan of buttermilk. They put in their cookies or other things, but they don't drink it. I like drinking it. <laughs> put some little bit of pepper, put a little bit of sea salt, crush, you know, a little bit of mint in that. Wonderful flavors. And add some water so it's not too thick. And you can have it with your meal. You know, try that. Try the recipe with the with the meal. Make it more savory. Um, other one, again, it's Japanese origin stuff. I don't know how many ordered miso in a sushi place, M-I-S-O miso. Another fantastic substitute for dairy. You know, it's a fermentation of the soy milk, and they put barley in that, and it's a Japanese use it for everything. Now it's coming to the West Coast, uh, California, and big cities. I think you can get it in most of the sushi places here as well. Miso soup or miso, and you can get miso concentrate, and you can put in any of the foods too. Any stews you make, tofu, add some, you know, that's a great idea to add a little bit of miso to tofu. So all those things, again, we're giving you a big variety. Maybe you're not a miso person, maybe you're a yogurt person, maybe you're a sordo bread person. So I'm not saying just that, but I'm saying all of that, a little bit of that every day. You will see the difference in your digestion. Cruciferous vegetables. How many know cruciferous vegetables here? Okay, boy, she should give the talk. Uh, cruciferous vegetables are, you know, uh, cauliflower, broccoli, arugula. So, what's so special about them? They have something called glucosinolates, you know, and they reduce cancer. Not only that, they provide the probiotics. Or prebiotics. That means for the good bacteria, what you're getting from fermented food to stick, it needs framework. It needs a mesh in the gut. And the fiber provides that mesh. Right? So the fiber comes from cruciferous vegetables, from whole grains, and we'll talk other things like garlic, onions, and ginger. Those provide the framework for those bacteria to hang out in your gut. So both are important. Uh, taking the fermented foods are important, and taking the prebiotics are important to make the ferment. So it's like gardening. You know, you need to have nice compost, good soil, good pH in the soil, and you need to have good seeds, to have good tomatoes or cucumber or whatever you're growing, right? Same thing in the gut. You need to have good strata, good framework with the fiber. That's your prebiotics. So you, you do that every day in different forms and we'll allude to that in a minute, but raw cauliflower, raw broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, all those are fantastic. And again, cabbage you can do in sauerkraut too. So that's when, when you get a fermented food along with the fiber. So that's a pre and probiotic mix right there for you to consume the sauerkraut. Whole grains. So why we keep talking about whole grains? What's what's the difference between eating a white bread versus whole grain bread? Why are we talk about it? The secret is in the germ, the G-E-R-M of the grain. When you have a processed grain, you throw away the husk and the germ. And that's where the nutrients and the fiber is. And we throw that away just to make it soft, which is the most important part of the grain. Starches, yes, you know, you'll get the starches, but having it, Mother Nature gives you a packet. And men took out the packet and say, ah, you know, it's not tasty. But the, now we're realizing that the whole grain, the taste part is important, but more important is that you get the fiber and the germ with it. So any grain you consume, if you can, for example, the oatmeal. If you can consume instead of the instant oatmeal, the steel cut oatmeal, which cooks slowly, it has the fiber in it. Anything which is slow to cook is pain in the butt. You're not going to get it in five minutes, but it will, your bacteria will thank you inside because you're providing them the prebiotics, the fiber for that. So 
Just think about it. White bread, brown bread, pick brown bread. Any bread with seeds hanging out, jump for it. So it's important to make good choices. You make good choices, most of you are seniors and most of you have kids and grandkids. They will make good choices too when they see you. If we have to lead by example. You can't just you know tell the next generation or grandkid generation that hey you, know, you eat better, you know, I had my days. But God willing you another 10, 15, 20 years. You know, you want to have good quality, and the food will provide you the quality. It will reduce you your weight because you'll be full with the fiber. It will help you lower your sugar, your diabetes will be under control. With your weight reduction, your blood pressure will be under control. So again, it comes back to the first line I said, <laughs> the body is a temple, you know, give good offerings. And you will see that theme going through in this paper. And everything is backed by research. So there is studies from where this data came about in the last sheet. So these are the references. So this is not a made up talk. I didn't even know about this talk till you know Jenny gave it to me. I said, boy, this is what I practice and this is what I teach my patients. So I said, yeah, that's a good topic. I want to do it. So let's talk about meats. I know you guys were a little bit worried when I said don't do meat, but you can do meats, but moderation. What kind of meats? Let's talk about that. Anything which is fatty fish, tuna, salmon, do more. Lean chicken, lean turkey, you know, do more. But give plants a chance first. So in other words, have a salad with a little bit of light dressing, not creamy dressing, light dressing, and a bowl of yogurt, a bowl of miso soup. Now you have taste left in your tummy. Have a salmon. You get a full meal. And you tick mark everything what is good for nutrition and is delicious. You then compromise on the taste by going that route. So think about the choices you make when you go to restaurants. There was a study done, and they found that if you order the breads in the end, you lose five pounds in a year. Think about it. If you, if the guy at Olive Garden bring the bread, which they will always bring up front, just say, hey, you know, bring it in the end. Now you didn't deprive yourself. You see, that's the key word. If you tell your brain, I'm not going to have bread, you're going to walk, or get the bread in five minutes. You're saying, we're going to have the bread, but hey, in the end, chances are you're not going to order. Because, you know, you'll be full by your salad, your soup, your entrees, your water. By the time the bread turn come, you say, ah, let's forget it. And that's the emphasis. Make good choices and don't tell your brain no. No is a bad word for brain. It's like a young kid. It'll, it'll find ways to get it. Say yes, yes, we're going to have it, but in the end. So just postpone it. You're going to have a craving for ice cream when you when you go to Publix and you want to buy a brick. Just say, let me go to the fruits and vegetables section first. I'm not saying no, I'll come back here. Just move away, go to the side of the grocery store where the fresh produce is. By the time you come here, you say, hey, I'm tired, let's forget it. Just don't say no, just say yes, but postpone. That's going to be a good, powerful tool. We talk about fruits, ginger, one of my favorite herbs. How many people use ginger in their food here? Oh boy, she is. I know, she should, Jenny, call me for no reason. You got an expert right there. She did the next one. Okay. So ginger is an amazing herb. It's a, you know, it helps you with the digestion. It helps to so-called gardening the, the, the good bacteria, what we call good microbiome. And it provides the fiber, uh, you know, if you consume it, uh, the, you know, the shredded part of the ginger uh, for the building the homes for those bacteria. So another good herb to consume in any way, shape, or form. And the last is obvious, the water. But 
you know, a lot of people, I still, you know, if you want to do an observational study, I'll suggest during the Christmas time, go to Clearwater Mall or Thailand Square Mall or one of the malls and just sit down and pretend to just do nothing. You will see the people with most weight will be carrying a super me soda in their hand. And kid me not, you will see 90% of the time the people with the most weight have a big, you know, McDonald's, Burger King, or whatever, like 100 ml soda plus in their hand. What's the problem there? The problem is satiety. When you consume liquid calories, whether it's soda or juices, now juices is another interesting one. People think it comes from fruit, must be good. BS. Why? Because it's liquid. You took away the most important part in your orange, let's say we are citrus state here. Let's talk about citrus. You took away the most important part of the fruit, which is the fiber. You know, if you get a medication which is extended release, you know, XL or ER medications, how do they work? They slow down the release of the medication so the gut get absorbed slowly so you can take it once a day, right? Instead of twice a day or three times a day. Same thing with the juice and your orange. If you consume an orange, try consuming two in one sitting. You say, yeah, you know, one is enough, I'm full. Why are you full? Fiber. Mother Nature gives you a package which is beautiful and complete. Men say, yeah, you know, let's squeeze it. Now, when you squeeze it, you get this much orange juice, you got six oranges there. It's pure sugar. Pure sugar. Water. Every orange with the water, you got the flavor, you got the satiety, and you won't get diabetic. And if you're diabetic, it won't make you get more insulin. Juices are the most misbranded item as healthy. No, they're not. Sodas, we know all. You know, juices no one talks about, but they are in the same category. They're just sugar, pure syrup sugar. Just a flavor to it. So if you have to make a choice of a liquid, and people come to me, I can't just drink plain water, there's no flavor. Good point. When you get up in the morning, you know, you got those big yetis or whatever, you know, big water bottles you have, put some ice, put some water, cut a lemon one day, next day put a slice of orange, let it simmer for an hour, drink throughout the day from that. Nice flavor. Put a bag of tea in that. Put a, you know, next day cucumber in that. You didn't add any calories, but you added flavors. You drink throughout the day from that cooler. Cheap? Yes. Better for you. So hydration is critical, like we gave you, I gave you an example of a good garden where you need good soil good compost, good seeds, and water. Same thing inside our gut. We need prebiotics from fruits and vegetables, from whole grains, and we need probiotics from fermented foods, and we need water to make the garden grow inside us. So if you think about any food choices you make, you think about, is that good for my garden inside? You mm -hmm. not go wrong. <coughs> and the last thing we'll talk about is the foods which are not good for your gut. And they are pretty opposite of what we discussed. Fried foods, too harsh spices. Spices are good, but don't overdo it. Alcohol can also, you know, in moderation, okay, one glass of wine here and there, doing holidays or if you're on a hard day, but not every day. And believe it or not, as we go past 30s and 40s, the capacity of the liver to process alcohol start diminishing. You, when you're in your you know, 20s, you can have three shots, four shots, next day you're back to work, nothing happened. Now trying having a glass of wine, 
next day, you know, you have a headache or hangover because the liver can't handle it. Too much caffeine, one cup is good, but don't do like four or five cups. We talk about carbonated drinks, absolutely no, no. One thing you can change, do not buy them. Please do not buy them. Pepsi, Coke, Publix brand, just say keep it, thank you. And dairy, we talked about dairy as we age, the gut does not have capacity to handle the dairy as much. So, but you can consume the dairy in other ways as I discussed from kefir, from buttermilk, from yogurt, from low fat cheese, from fermented cheese, you can get your dairy from there instead of consuming it. You know, if you like a glass of milk, I'm nothing against it. You know, but don't go beyond a glass. All right, so that's what I have for you today. And I'll close by just saying the same thing I started with. Body is a temple. Please give good offerings to it. It'll be nice to you. All right, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Yes, ma'am. So for people that can't, like that, why is in the care tree for Lou Heron or gone for that hour, and it might get worse? Um, plant based um, protein shakes? What do, you, what do you think about the plant based so, protein So, you know. Yeah, our question is plants, trade, protein, shake, art. Human tendency is we want convenience. We don't want to put our elbow grease into, you know, taking take care of us. But unfortunately, you got to work for your health. Same thing for your nutrition. So anything which has come from a manufacturing plant, even if it says fiber, even if it says plant-based, use less. Anything with come directly from a plant, use more. You can use a blender, you can boil it, so it's easy to chew, but know exactly what you're putting in your mouth. When it's made in a manufacturing plant, the whole emphasis is A, flavor, B, shelf life. Not for nutrition. Not for nutrition, unfortunately. So, if you can cook from scratch, make it soft, cut it, boil it, Steam it better. Yes, ma'am. I have to go. Yes, ma'am. I'm very impressed with your credentials. Yeah, I'm looking far away. I have to have a primary care folks where I live. Okay. If you're happy, I'm happy. Thank you. Any other questions? I just want to make a statement. Yes, ma'am. I was a nurse for 26 years and college nurse. Oh, wow. So I very well know of your reputation. Sure. And that was excellent. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, and the cancers are tied with the food too. Yes. A lot of people don't realize that uh, you know the food choices we make make a big difference in the cancers, whether we get it or we don't get it. So.